let's get started again for today. Just a couple of quick announcements and reminders. Uh, today, there is a Society of American Foresters. I sound like a bunch of smart, good looking, upstanding youths. Uh, that meeting is today in this very room, Act 166, at 6 p.m. So, this is a great way for, especially those of you who are first term freshmen, to kind of get more connected and uh, embedded and involved in uh, your program, meet more of your classmates, upperclassmen, stuff like that. And uh, just a great way to kind of understand that there is a big, big professional network of foresters who come through our program. You know, we're one of the top programs in the country. And our Salubi alums, forestry are literally all over the world and especially all over the country. I have never taken students on summer camp and not accidentally, but kind of accidentally on purpose, run into uh, our alums just out doing field work in Colorado, Utah, Maine. Um, I mean, we are genuinely all over the country and the world. So SAF is a great way to start plugging into that. And the earlier you jump in and, you know, start meeting people and stuff like that, uh, the easier it is for you to jump into stuff like uh, student trips to our forestry conferences all across the country. We have regional and national things. Uh, it's a great way to kind of just low-key start building your network now without really any effort at all. Um, and that can genuinely help you get a foot in the door when it's time to get a JLB uh, either for the summer or for uh, like career blast off when you are ready to graduate. Uh, there is also Forestry Club practice every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, 2.30 at um, the TIC, the Tree Improvement or Timber Improvement Center. It's one of our research facilities over, uh, research facilities for forestry over on the university farms, kind of out that way. So if you have a car, great. If you don't, it's kind of a long Segway ride. Um, so maybe see if we can get a classmate to take you over that. Uh, forestry club practices for stuff like timber sports. So uh, it's like land navigation, tree and other species identification, um, like bucksaw, chainsaw events, pole climbing, log rolling, all sorts of stuff. Um, just for getting some of those practical sort of physical skills and um, like the navigation is more of a mental skill kind of a thing. And we compete and um, when I started at SIU as a professor, I don't know, 10, 12 years ago, um, we had won the forestry conclave as SIU forestry like 19 out of the past 20 years. And then uh, one of our rivals, Wisconsin Stevens Point, may calumny and bitterness be heaped upon them, hired a professional timber sports competitor to coach them, and they started winning. Uh, and now we're, we're winning about 50% of the time, um, but it's it's a real good time. Conclave is an absolute stinking blast. So if you like doing this stuff, you like chopping things up and meeting your fellows at other universities and stuff like that, um, this is a real blast. So that's 2.30 p.m. Monday, Wednesday, Friday at um, it's 241 Thunderstorm Road. That address will kind of confuse some GPS programs. Um, I think Google Maps gets it right, but Apple Maps is a little bit shaky. Uh, so maybe for the first couple of times, if you're interested in that, ride with somebody so you can figure out where it is, how to get there, and then uh, you're good to go on your own. Also, Ruckner is the advisor for the shooting sports team, which is cool. We have a pistol range right off campus, kind of in the same direction on Minitree Road, which is kind of over by, uh, over by the TIC, and kind of not. Um, so yeah, check those out. Any other announcements for the good of the cause? Other clubs, meetings, stuff like that? Any other fun or interesting forestry, outdoor recreation, management, kinds of things going on around Southern Illinois? That might be fun, extra credit opportunities for you and your buddies. The giant city, the monarchs that are flying the migrating here right now, Giant City has a program called Book a Time Slot. They give you like a net and some equipment, and you go out and catch one of the flies, and they tag them. So that's really cool. It's going on every day of September. So, all month. So that's cool. 
They are migrating from down in Mexico, uh, central Mexico, and that is it's weird to think of these tiny little insects going like several thousand miles, but that's how they do. And that is a long and difficult and fraught, as the boomers would say, journey. So this is a pretty cool conservation effort. It takes a whole lot of people in multiple states and countries to hook together migratory habitat. This is a hard thing to do well. It's a big lift. It's a wicked problem for those of you who have taken social influences or natural resources conflict management with Dr. Akamani. So check that out. Butterfly banding at Giant City State Park. Giant City, also, for those of you who haven't been there yet, is a place that was built out by the United States Civilian Conservation Corps in the 1930s during the Great Depression in the 40s. Pretty cool stuff. There's not a lot of CCC places sort of still working and in use. Um, this is back when we were doing everything pretty much by hand and trying to have a lot of Americans not starve to death by employing young folks, um, mostly men in these work camps at that time, to basically chop down a whole bunch of trees, dig up a bunch of field stones by hand, carry all the stuff to construction sites, cut trails to bring materials back and forth, and uh, Touch of Nature, which is right next to Giant City um, State Park, has a whole bunch of old CCC trails and work sites and stuff like that. The lodge at Giant City was built by the CCC. So if you ever go there to get like fried chicken Sunday family lunch or whatever, which is awesome if you're into meat, I'm just saying, it's delicious. Uh, Check out the history of the lodge. Just kind of wander around sort of the, the visitor center portion of the lodge, not the restaurant portion. And it's legit, it's the real thing. Also, uh, some of our students have over time done internships or tons of volunteer stuff, but also uh, a few have stick, stuck around to get jobs in Southern Illinois doing forestry, forest rec stuff at Giant City State Park. So. That's something to keep in mind if you're one of those folks who love Southern Illinois for any of the many reasons that it's worthy of loving um, and you want to stick around here after graduating. There aren't a million jobs down here, but those that are here are pretty all right. Okay, so if you want to take a longer view on sticking around, that's cool. If you want to head off to that mythical land of milk and honey where the forestry graduates flocked like the salmon of Capistrano, that is Colorado and Wyoming, and Eastern Utah. Uh, that's cool too. We have a ton of our graduates out there, a ton. All right, well that said, let's jump back into our kind of vocabulary stuff. Um, we've finally gotten through that very first slide with like 15, 18, 20 definitions on it. Let's jump forward into the late 90s PowerPoint technology and get like actual graphics on some of these. Here we go. Hang on to your butts. So we've been talking about how in some of our earlier class sessions, forest and outdoor recreation is pretty tied to your discretion. Remember we did that simple class exercise on if you had discretion over your time and just kind of a whole bunch of money to obviate or remove the need for paying for a trip, what would you do over a long like Labor Day weekend kind of a thing? So that is a particularly modern and particularly American sense of what leisure as a broader thing sort of encompassing forest and outdoor recreation and other stuff like sports these days and hobbies and stuff like, believe it or not, endlessly scrolling your social media feed mindlessly and sending people snapchats and stuff like that. There's a lot more going on than just forest and outdoor recreation. So let's jump back in time a little bit to the Romans and take a look at this concept of leisure and what it meant to them, which is not the same as what it meant to us. So this is kind of a quick introduction to our later on history of forest and outdoor recreation and its development into the modern concept of it. But Kondo in 1975 uh, put together this sense of the word 
stem or the the a time on as it's called the foreign word from which our modern word of leisure is built licere or latin is permission right so we get that sense of discretion when you are a roman citizen your empire was built on the backs of human enslaved people and that meant that you didn't have to be the one doing so-called stoop labor that is bending over and chopping a plant off at the stem and bringing it to the villa as they would call their farmhouses and mansions um, and washing that stuff off and like making a salad right somebody else is doing that for you so you have permission from the senate and the senate is the representative of the collective will of roman citizens and the senate says it is okay for roman citizens to do leisurely things so the roman empire the greeks before them some of the some of the first uh, nations or states to get into this idea of ruling people isn't about an individual monarch or a demagogue, right? a popular leader. It is more about the collective will of the people, and the people in this case giving themselves permission to have some fun and do anything more than work and march around and kill people. All right. Way, 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 way forward in time from there, like 1700 years later, 15 to 1700 years later, we have the French concept, which is evolving from a kind of tacit or formal legal permission to do leisurely things to kind of more of a free time sense of things. Okay? In this French distillation of the terms, so like 15, 16, 17, 1800s kind of a thing, the vast majority of people still living agrarian or farm-based lives. Industrial cities, not a thing yet. But for the relatively few, the landed elites that have free time because everybody else is busy growing and butchering stuff for them, like all of the serfs, we would call them in English, uh, people tied to the property to produce uh, foodstuffs and material goods, the landed elites have some free time, and they already have that permission kind of built in. Right? That's what it meant to be nobility at that time, to be educated, one of the relatively very few who could read, for example. Okay. And from these ideas and their sort of forward evolution, we get the modern concept of leisure. We have the permission built in. You don't have to get my approval to low-key be scrolling Snapchat in class. You just pull out your phone and kind of ignore me for a minute and do it, okay? And you have sort of the free time. These days, we're paying a whole lot of attention in leisure studies to things like, where's your attention going? Because you have a permission, you have a free time, but you have a limited and single-threaded supply of attention. And you and I and everybody else in the United States, pretty much, sees on average, on average, up to a couple of thousand advertisements per day. Each one of those is a bid by a company for your attention. If they can get your attention, then they can get a sense of, or implant in you, try to incept in you a sense of, you have a need. And their product or service satisfies that need. Whether or not that need is real or perceived doesn't really matter. If you think you have that need, then effectively or practically speaking, you have that need. And so you're more likely to get activated. That is, pull out your credit card and tap it on the thing or put your thumbprint or your face print up and authorize a transaction and what you were doing for leisure, watching YouTube videos, whatever, uh, online, on your phone, has turned you into a consumer because of the way that attention is manipulated on screens. 
So, these days, leisure is a bit of a battlefield. And it never used to be that way until about 2007 with the advent of the iPhone and mass cellular distribution of advertising systems. More on that later. So, we've got the Roman, we've got the French, we've got sort of the modern American academic definitions or senses of the concept or idea of leisure. But what does that mean to you? You don't necessarily have to agree with or buy, so to speak, no pun intended, any of those three senses of leisure. So, in a sentence or two, what does leisure mean to you as an idea or a concept? What do you think of? What do you imagine when you're thinking of leisure? For me, as you're getting your thoughts together, it is one of kind of two things. Doing something very active like hiking the Appalachian Trail after college. Uh, or upon retirement is another common way for time for people to do that. And on the other end, leisure for me is also sitting at home on the weekend, hunched over a computer, designing a trading card game and prototyping it with my wife. Like, my wife is the coolest freaking human being on the planet to me. And I got Appalachian Trail is pretty fantastic, but you know what is also fantastic? Seeing my wife smile playing a game that I'm designing. That feels really good to me. That sounds like a pretty high quality Sunday afternoon. Also, as a non-academic side note, my wife also asked me to bring you guys donuts. So, we can all benefit from the amazing person that she is. If you guys, gals, everybody who likes donuts, we'll just send those around here. We've got about two dozen. All right? So. These donuts have nothing to do with anything. They were just spared at our church for a weekend, but uh, yeah, I hate to see food go to waste, you know? All right, whoever wants some. There you go, have at it. All right, so with that whole preamble, whether it's something big like hiking the Appalachian Trail or something sort of lighter weight like hanging out on a Sunday afternoon with a special somebody and just like playing a board game, playing a card game, or even just like sleeping in? What do you think of as leisure for you? Think about not working. Not working. All right, everything that is not working and maybe not sleeping. Okay, cool. Anybody else? Probably just like going to the archery range, like practice shot and go. Okay, practicing an outdoor skill. Makes a lot of sense to me. So there's like doing the outdoor thing, maybe like bow hunting, for example, if you like doing that. Um, and for some people, the practice, going to the range, is the actual like leisure activity, not just preparation for it. Cool, so you get that one kind of both ways if you want. Anybody else? What does leisure mean to you? What's, what's a nice afternoon or five months of hiking the trail? Something like that. What's that look like for you? Really anything relaxing, but also anything fun. It doesn't need to be relaxing. It doesn't need to be about anything else. Interesting. Okay, so there's a distinction, a separation between relaxing and fun. Maybe, for some people. Okay, so... Something that's relaxing. My wife is reading the, um, the Thrawn trilogy and the Star Wars, like the old books, because the Disney series is out right now, uh, or Ahsoka. That's pretty relaxing. But what's something that might be more fun than relaxing? For you or for anybody else, open question. Battlefront 2, a classic. Often imitated, never duplicated. <laughs> so, we're going to come back to this idea of we tend to kind of subdivide leisure 
in our own heads and in our behaviors, our expressed behaviors, of we've got kind of the relaxing side of things. We might call that passive. Now passive has some negative connotations and stuff like that, but for us it just means not like actively like leaning forward doing something like playing a video game or actively heading to an archery range and letting fly some arrows and stuff like that. Okay, so we'll come back to that. We'll see a little bit more of that. So back in the 1700s, kind of when we'll say the uh, essentially the French and English and Spanish empires were the global superpowers of that time, projecting force and uh, property extraction and wealth extraction. Uh, through the use of their navies and stuff like that, right? So in the early 1700s, the British Navy is uh, extracting a lot of coastal American timber from places like Georgia with its huge live oak trees, building out an extremely powerful navy and stuff like that. And then in the late 1700s, the French Navy blockades some British ports for the American Revolution as a little bit of an FU to the Brits across the English Channel. And a whole new nation gets spun out from that, the United States. Back in the year 1700, with that as context, we have kind of this pretty sort of grim or depressing sense of how people spent their time and how much of that time and effort and energy, calories if you want to think of it that way, how much of that could be leisure. So. You get to spend 12 hours a day on subsistence. So that's like, on average, about eight hours a day of sleeping. An hour a day of like cleaning yourself, cleaning your immediate space so you're not living in filth directly. Not really taking a shower every day, cleaning your body every day, but just like basic home maintenance kind of stuff, sweeping the stoop, um, emptying the chamber pot since we didn't have flush toilets back then, out the window onto the sidewalk. And then a couple hours a day, every day, like cooking and preparing to work and stuff like that. We call that subsistence time. Things you gotta do to keep your body alive. And then existence time is about 11 hours a day for people working the fields, for people working in a blacksmith's shop or a cobbler, a shoemaker's shop or a cooper's shop, a person who makes barrels for storing liquids. That's about 11 hours a day. So the life at that time didn't really typically, on average, leave a whole lot of time and energy for leisure, that sense of free time, okay? Because we don't have modern conveniences like microwaves, we don't have common to us uh, things like food preservation technologies. We gotta prepare everything fresh or let it ferment typically for a period of at least a couple of months, like sauerkraut. Over in the Germanic language family, European countries at that time. And that takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of time and takes a lot of effort to do everything manually yourself. We have a little bit of division of labor with things like blacksmiths and leather workers and tailors and seamstresses, stuff like that. But for the most part, you're doing most of what you need to do to survive yourself. Fast forward to 1950, after the American and Western European Industrial Revolutions, we have a pretty big jump or shift in leisure and free time. Now with things like water heaters and flush toilets and showers, we're carving a decent amount of time, a couple hours, off of subsistence. Again, those activities you need to do to keep your body alive. Okay. And with the advent of the Eisenhower interstate system, which was uh, starting to go into place, uh, we get highways, a lot more rural roads paved, following the Great Depression and the Civilian Conservation Corps, the Works Progress Administration, um, uh, the Federal Highway Administration, stuff like that. Big government projects to do things like pave muddy dirt roads so that you can go a lot farther a lot faster. A lot of this was subsidized by 
American auto industry companies based out of Detroit for the most part, so that we had roads to drive all these expensive cars on and literally drive the American economy forward by repurposing <coughs> World War II factory capacity towards consumer goods. The net effect of this is a quadrupling, a quadrupling since about the year 1900 of the amount of free time, the discretionary time, the leisure time that you and I and everybody else, uh, something like 100 million Americans at that time, that we had. That's a big shift. So if you are working yourself 23 hours a day just to stay alive and then after a while you've got like four hours a day to not be working yourself to the bone you can get into a lot more you can think about stuff like I'm gonna go to the archery range for fun instead of I have to go to the archery range to become a better shot or I'm gonna starve to death in 1700 okay so that's a big shift that's a real big shift and it frees up that sort of mind space of archery is fun versus archery is a necessary survival skill and I can get good at I can enjoy archery for its own sake instead of having to be good at it to put food on the table now these are super duper smoothed out like averages okay to this day we have people who are subsistence hunting in southern Illinois uh, some of the southernmost counties in Illinois are some of the lowest socioeconomic status, lowest affluence counties in the entire country. And so people need to be able to shoot deer to put calories on the table for themselves and their families. So we want to be real careful about kind of painting with too broad of a brush, right? And there are folks who are never going to touch a firearm or a trap or a bow type uh, hunting tool for putting calories on the table. In fact, most of us won't across the course of our lives in any serious capacity. But we have the option to now if we want to. And that is a seismic shift. That is a tectonic change versus how things used to be back in the day. Another way to illustrate this kind of trend is the sense of how many hours a week does somebody have to work? These days, the current debate um, with like unions versus employers, like right now, today, going on, is it seems like a lot of the research shows that you get the most productivity out of people, the most value added to the company's profit and bottom line, by working people about 32 hours a week, which is down from 40 hours a week, which is kind of our standard default sense of how much people need to work um, in order to be sort of contributory Americans to American progress. So life is not all about money, but when you can attach monetary values to things, some folks like to think of it that way. Make sense? But you can see from 1840, kind of pre-Civil War, if you want to think of it in those terms, a typical work week is about 70 hours a week. Okay, so that's that 10 hours a day versus 11 hours a day uh, going on, uh, you know, seven days a week. That's 12 hours a day, six days a week. If you want to think of it that way, it's about 70 hours a week. So this is a lot. This is a lot. And in a fairly short period of decades, right, 1840 to 1940, we have people living from the year 1840 to the year 1940, 100 year old centenarians. In living memory, they saw the work week shrink by almost half, from 70 down to about 40, 42 hours. Okay? That's a big change. And that means you and I and everybody else, we have a lot more free time and energy because we're not spending 10, 12 hours a day, five or six days a week. Now it could be, well, if you work for the federal government, uh, or some state governments, you can work what are called four tens. Your 40 hour sort of mandatory work week for a salary job is divided across four days and every week is a three day weekend all year long. That sounds kind of nice. 
So if you like doing the 10 hour workday thing, a 32 hour work week, which is what some folks are pushing for these days, you could have kind of a, a long three day work week, right? 10 or 11 hours per day. And then have a four day weekend every week. I mean, to some of us, that sounds like some bullshit. But to others of us, it's like, why wouldn't we do that? Some of us aren't here to work ourselves to the bone. Let's realize everything else that humans are capable of with things like automation and robotics and advanced genetics and so on and so forth. So as of about 2010, we get a somewhat different sense of things. Where with our smartphones, where with notifications of your Clash of Clans plan war, getting your watch buzzing on your wrist to remind you to log back in and see those super saturated colors and juicy UI and made up gold and he looks for rewards, right? That's kind of all day long. But let me double check this because researchers started noted, noticing this, excuse me, around 2010 with, you know, this rapid spread of smartphones and stuff like that. What's your sense of, for those of you who've worked before, what's your sense of kind of this blending of leisure and subsistence time, excuse me, existence time, no, subsistence, the working part. What's your sense of this blending? Does this still kind of hold true? Like if you're stocking shelves at Schnucks, or uh, if you're more of a sort of mid-range grocery shopper, um, or German shopping places kind of here in the uh, east part of town, Aldi. You're stocking shelves, but do you have a second to pull up your phone and see a funny video that your friend sent you right there while you're working? Like, is that a thing? And then you throw your phone back in your pocket and you keep stocking shelves and you don't have to like go to an archery range to not really laugh at your friend's funny video, but like do that exhale through your nostrils thing. Like, that was pretty funny. Is that a thing these days? Is that kind of how life goes? All right, cool. So we have the sense of I'm going to the archery range or I'm going to the pistol range to do shooting sports. And we also have I'm at work and I need to be at work and focusing. Maybe for some of you who are not like working an employment job right now, like your job is being in these classrooms, learning this stuff, getting the certifications and skills so that you can uh, make an income later on and so forth. Education. And then you got that in-between space. Have any of you guys, gals ever worked on a homework assignment with a TV screen or like a laptop monitor on in the background and you're streaming something? Okay, that's this sense of blended leisure where it's not Maybe it's not as exciting or fulfilling or satisfying as going to an archery range, but you don't have time for that right now. You gotta write this paper for Park who assigned you this thing and it's due tomorrow and this is bullshit and we're just making stuff up, whatever. <laughs> but I don't have to suffer through that, at least I can listen to a podcast while I'm doing this and kind of split my attention or ease the sting of having to study for a big watersheds exam coming up with Williard's class uh, or scoot over and like I'll just hang out and study for it but also be just texting with friends at the same time. That makes sense? This is different than how things used to be. Like this is wildly different than how things used to be because all of those notifications, all those those tempting distractions in a negative sense or nice bits of break or rest or defocus from what you're trying to concentrate on like those things don't know about your needs or your schedule they're just coming in constantly right it's like that friend who wants to go out to um tracks or traz or whatever the 
hanger and you're like, no, I gotta study. But they're like, come on, you can study at the bar. And you're like, no, I can't. And they're like, yes, you can. Uh, right? There's this, this sense or this sort of behavior cycle of blending that is a new thing in human existence. Think about that for a sec. You are the first generation in all of humanity to go through college the way that you are, to work the way that you do now and that you will in the future. You are the first. We are running this massive experiment on what is good, worthwhile, healthy, sustainable, neurodevelopmentally not harmful. Did you know your brain is growing in a different structure fundamentally than people who grew up without computers? That's a thing. Yep. Yeah, that is a real thing. And it's a grand experiment. We don't know what's going to happen. It's all very exciting. I hope it turns out well. I'm sure it's going to turn out fine. We're all going to die, actually. All right. So given this blended sense of things, beyond what your sense of leisure is, how much free time on a given day of 24 hours would you say that you have? Is it four hours a day, like the average person in 1950? Is it more? Is it a lot less? Are you super slammed, working two jobs, classes full time, and if you're not doing those things, you're horizontal sleeping? What's your sense of your amount of free time? Anybody? Six hours a day? Okay. Anybody else? I agree with six hours. I think that's about six hours a day? Okay. So that's a 50% improvement on people in 1950. That's a pretty big jump, too. Okay. If I was getting a 50% return on an investment, I could retire a trillionaire real fast. Okay. So this is a big shift, and it's happening right now. And generally speaking, folks aren't kind of paying a lot of attention to it because it's generally a pretty subtle thing. So let's kind of break this down in a slightly more formal or academic sense and we'll be able to see some of these shifts that are invisible to most people most of the time um, and be able to kind of deal with that. Think about it and then finally apply it to forestry. So we've talked about how it was free time or unobligated time, discretionary time. Then, we're saying now it maybe looks a little bit more like, okay, maybe I am not fully free, but I've got more hours on average than folks 70 years ago did in 1950. And I can also just pull out my phone when I'm sitting on the toilet at work and just get like a couple of minutes of whatever apps you turn to when you're on the toilet. A lot of us do, okay? I'm not saying I do, right? Professors aren't actual human beings, but yeah. Sorry, what's discretionary time? Discretionary time, great question. Discretionary time is, discretion is any resource that you have control over your choices for. So something is at your discretion when you call the shots about that thing, okay? over your choices. Good question. Any other questions? I know this one. All right, cool. Um, they're kind of adjacent ideas. Leisure is very broad. It means a lot of things to a lot of people. Discretionary time is a much more narrow definition of part of leisure, right? So in order to achieve leisure, which has a bunch of ingredients like skill, gears, interest level, uh, community or subculture based around it, stuff like that. Uh, places to go and do that stuff or devices to do it on virtually. This is specifically the sort of the, the legal and the socio-cultural uh, norms of other people think that I have control over this, so I do because they're not trying to take over my control of this, whatever this is, okay? So, uh, Good question. 
these days we have to acknowledge that for a lot of thousands of years in the past humans have not all had fair and sort of equal like access to discretion over their locations and things that they do and how much time they have per day or per year to do those things. This is a very modern effort, okay? So, access is who can show up? Who has the awareness to know that they can show up, whether or not they legally can, okay? Who has the socioeconomic status, like resources, material goods, health, for example, to be able to afford to get to Giant City State Park on a Sunday afternoon for fried chicken and maybe a short hike, hopefully before, because, man, who would want to go hiking after eating fried chicken? Not a great idea, in my opinion. You do you. Access is part of this sense of leisure now. If everybody doesn't have a fair shot at it, then we're not doing everything as well as potentially we could. Equity is, is it genuinely, functionally, meaningfully, like fair? Is there an open and equal opportunity for everybody to get into the thing? Okay. So back in the day, uh, up until the, what, 1950s and 60s, uh, and the advent of the civil rights movement, a lot of places didn't have equitable access, like separate bathrooms for certain kinds of people. Back in the 1940s, if you were Catholic, Jewish, non-heterosexual, or a whole sort of laundry list of other undesirable to the Third Reich folks, this was kind of a survival issue. You know, you get rounded up and shipped by train to a work camp or an extermination camp. And there were, according to researchers, 40,000 work, prison, and death camps across uh, Europe in, or by the end of World War II, right? So these days we're generally shooting for no pun intended. Not that. Right? And not just avoiding the negative, but elevating everybody. Making sure everybody's got a spot at the table if you want to go hunting. Like, do you feel safe walking into a meeting of people who like whitetail hunting? For somebody like me? Absolutely. Yeah. I love venison sticks. They're tasty. And usually when you get together with a bunch of hunters, somebody's brought some venison sticks and that's one evidence that God loves us and wants us to be happy. I'm joking, right? Whatever spiritual practices you do that. But for some people, walking into a room full of probably mostly white, probably mostly male, probably generally politically conservative people who enjoy hunting is either kind of intimidating or not appealing or downright feels like it might be unsafe okay at the beginning of the 20th century in the southern United States on average there was at least one lynching of a melanated like an african-american person every single day 365 days a year that creates a kind of perception and in that case a reality of genuine danger so when we talk about equity and access to forests for stuff like hiking and horseback riding and camping and all the million awesome things you can do in Shawnee and stuff like that, some people see the forest as a dangerous place. Not because there's anything dangerous in the forest, but because there are people who are dangerous or that we think might be dangerous in that forest. And if the perception is there, and that perception is effectively the reality for those people. It's keeping them out. 
whether or not they're actually unsafe people that would seek to harm them. Okay. And the way things have kind of shaken out over time, we have the sense of environmental justice. Has anybody ever heard that term before? Environmental justice. Okay. The basic kind of thumbnail or postage stamp size definition of environmental justice is the sense of the winners have clean, nearby, high quality environments to access, enjoy, to get clean drinking water from, to breathe clean air from, and stuff like that. And folks who have lost, historically, some access and equity battles through being enslaved or discriminated against or what have you, they tend to be relegated to have to live in places that are a little bit or a lot less clean, less safe drinking water, less safely breathable air. So um, there was the, uh, was it a coal processing yard uh, somewhere on the outskirts of the Chicagoland area? And downwind from that was um, a community like overwhelmingly of color. And so when like it was windy and stuff like this, like coal dust is blowing onto this neighborhood full of houses and schools and stuff like that. And lots of people getting kind of real sick over time from that. People started noticing, wow, it tends to be a certain kind of person that's getting kind of getting screwed by having to breathe that kind of air. So what do we do about that? Is that fair to them? Does that demonstrate they have less kind of fair access, less meaningful equity in just being able to breathe without you know, like breathing in cobalt and heavy metal dust uh, that tends to come along with coal, black lung disease for coal miners and stuff like that back in the day. Here's a visual example of it. So the caption at the top reads, I, I'm still not sure what they expected us to do outside. There's a speech bubble in this sort of detailed map of kind of a quasi-urban, kind of suburban environment with lots of limited access highways, so high-speed vehicle travel, not a lot of sidewalks. We've got a Walmart with no loitering. We've got streets labeled stranger danger. We've got a pond in a golf course, which is a leisure thing, right? Close to a whole bunch of much larger houses. You see how those buildings are much larger around the golf course? That's a thing, okay? And the pond itself is labeled useless decorative pond. You can't go swimming in a golf course's pond. They get so mad at you when you do that. We all saw Happy Gilmore, right? All right? And then we've got a second pond that says even more useless pond. It's a drainage or a water catchment area because this whole space basically is paved. It's all a runoff and it's gonna collect in a spot like that and be kind of dangerous and gross, right? There's a mall, no loitering. There's a dead big box store. There's a dying store. So we've got a park, but if you're a kid being told to play outside, you gotta cross from like the neighborhood where the rest of us live you got to get across all of this on your bicycle or on foot to the park, which is served primarily by cars, safely served by cars, okay? So this is kind of a low-key illustration of the sense of access, equity, environmental justice. The people who have, their backyard opens up onto a golf course. That's a pretty nice spot for a kid to grow up, right? Just go run around right out your back door. For everybody else, maybe not. And because our situation is pretty different in terms of population distribution these days, we have a large majority of people in the United States now living more in a setting like this than we do back in the 1700s at the beginning of class, where almost everybody, 95% plus, are living on and around farm complexes and you've got the wood lot and the streams and like you go out your back door and there's some wild space within sort of quick walk or jog distance for a huge majority of the population. So in some ways things have gotten a whole lot better and in some ways we made a whole lot worse. Our access and equity and opportunity 
All right, so let's end it right there. We'll end about 30 seconds early today. I'm around for questions if you have them. Grab another donut on your way out if you would like. And I'll see you on Thursday. No reading assignment for tonight.